A very warm welcome to EPG Parshala and I'm Dr. Swati Banerjee, Associate Professor at the School of Social Work at Tata Institute of Social Sciences. And today I'll be talking to you on ecofeminism, uh, which is part of the course on gender and social work. As you see in this picture, uh, ecofeminism essentially tries to look at the intrinsic connection between women and nature. And this is what we'll try and discuss today. The key topics that we will try to understand uh, would be uh, an initial understanding of what is ecofeminism and how it has originated. As we know that there are different strands of ecofeminism, and ecofeminism is largely considered to be a third wave feminism. So we'll try and trace this ev evolution. We'll also try to look at the origin and key constructs in ecofeminism. What are the key theoretical discussions leading to what would be some of the roots of ecofeminism, how it has emerged, and the key strands in ecofeminism, the discussions and debates within that. And finally, we'll see how do we uh, take this discussion forward through references and a deeper understanding. So what is ecofeminism? Ecofeminism is both an activist and an academic movement. So it's not just an academic theory. It has emerged from a lot of activism and it tries and explores the interlinkages between nature and women, the human and the non-human world, and tries to see the critical connections between the domination of nature and the exploitation of women. Uh, women have been, especially rural women, women in so-called developing countries, have been uh, living very close to nature and a lot of their work has been integrated, their daily work has been integrated with nature. However, we see that there is a lot of environmental destruction, environmental degradation that's happening to them, that's happening today. How does it impact women? Uh, how does it impact marginalized communities? And can ecofeminism give us an analytical framework to understand these concepts, understand these experiences? For example, uh, some time back, I was in Sundarbans, which is a bioreserve in West Bengal. And uh, because of the increasing tourism and environmental degradation in that area, there is increasing human nature conflict and it's really uh, impacting the local communities and causing death of people. And I went further, went interior villages and I went to this uh, one para or community or village where as I spoke to every woman in every second household, they had a story to say. And what did the story say? They would say that either their husband has been killed by a tiger or somebody would narrate a story of how her son was killed while trying to fetch uh, the honey or killed by a crocodile. And the entire community, that entire para is called a Vido para or in Bengali it's called Bidhoba para. That's the extent of marginality, that's the extent of impact of different forces including environmental degradation and a mainstream developmental forces that's impacting women and men and there are layered experiences that women face. Now, the question therefore is, how do we understand why do women still have to stay or why do marginalized communities still have to say, stay in this extreme condition where death, where death is a daily reality? And let's try and explore this further through the lens of ecofeminism. The origin and the key constructs of ecofeminism. The term ecofeminism was first used by the French feminist Francoise de Eubon in 1974 and it was held as a third wave of feminism. 
As we have seen, the first and second wave of feminism has largely dealt with women's rights, women's bodies, women's sexualities. The third wave of feminism have moved beyond their immediate to looking at the relationship with their surrounding and ecofeminism has been born out of this understanding. The concept was developed further by Yenestra King in 1976. Ecofeminists primarily focus on uh, the human being's domination of the non-human world or nature. So they are not only looking at the domination of men over women, but the domination of human beings over the non-human world. And how does that impact people? How does it impact communities? Especially how does it impact marginalized and rural communities? They say environmental destruction and social injustice like racism, casteism, poverty, sexism have a common cause. That is the hierarchical thinking, that's the patriarchal hierarchical thinking that's there in our society. According to Karen Warren, uh, the, she says, the Western world's basic beliefs, values and attitudes and assumptions about itself and its inhabitants have been shaped by an oppressive patriarchal conceptual framework, the purpose of which is to explain, justify and maintain relationships of domination and subordination in general and men's domination over women in particular. The key features of this domination uh, has been explained by Karen Warren in uh, the book by Rosemary Tong. And she delineates three key understandings to discuss this domination of the human over the non-human world and by men over women. The first, she talks about hierarchical thinking particularly up-down thinking, which values anything that is up more than what is down. So certain things are considered to be greater than other. That's about hierarchical thinking. Then she also talks about value dualism, that is oppositional or contrasting pairs that give higher value to one over the other. For example, male over female. And there is also a historicity of this understanding, light over darkness, independence over interdependence, reason over emotion. It's not seen as complementary to each other, it's, it's seen as two oppositional uh, realities. Further, logic of domination. Now, logic of domination means structuring the argument in a way that justifies the domination or subordination of one group over the other. Hence, it functions through the concept of power over, as we know that there are three key understandings of power and power over is absolute power that one group exerts over the other. So let's see an example of how does this operate, value hierarchy, value dualism and the logic of dominance. Let's say you are good in sports and your friend is good in singing. Is there a problem with that? Absolutely not, I suppose. However, the idea of value hierarchy and value dualism will then place sports above singing and sports would be considered better than singing. Further, the logic of dominance will create its own illogical logic, so to say, and it will say, since sports is considered better than singing, therefore, you are better than your friend. And that's the logic of dominance, which comes to an overall understanding of a, and creates a logic of dominance and subordination of the human world over the non-human world, of men over women, over certain caste groups against or over certain other caste groups. So there is a hierarchy that and an othering that happens in our society through this logic of dominance. Some roots of ecofeminism. There are various ecological concerns uh, which we have been facing for some time, like global warming, depletion of forest, etc. 
And this over the years has created an understanding and simultaneously a consciousness about the depletion of environment and the serious threat that it was facing in the contemporary times. This led to the emergence of environmental movements all over the world. Though all environmentalists argue that humans should respect environment, but the reasons for that argument put forth by each of the groups vary. Based on this understanding, there are various kinds of environmentalisms that have evolved over a period of time. For example, and some of the key ones include Deep Ecology, Gaia and Ecosophy. Now let's look at some of this a little more closely. Deep Ecology. Deep Ecology is again an environmental movement and not only a movement, it's a way of thinking, it's a philosophy with the core principle that like humanity, the living environment as a whole has a right to live and flourish. Basically, the key and implicit understanding here is that the earth is a living being and human beings are only part of that larger living ecosystem. The term deep ecology was first introduced by the Norwegian activist and philosopher Erneness in the early 1970s when stressing the need to move beyond superficial response to the social and ecological problems we face. Basically, he was trying to say that a shallow understanding of environmental degradation and environmental problems will not solve these realities and will create further problem for the earth and human beings. Deep ecology describes itself as deep because it moves beyond, as I said, superficial responses and beliefs in asking deeper questions concerning why and how. For example, if there is depletion of forest, it's not just about how many trees we have lost, how many species we have lost. It's about why we have lost, how we have lost, who has been responsible for it. A central tenet, therefore, humans have no right to reduce the diversity of the environment except to satisfy their vital human needs. Um, the four directions of deep ecology includes uh, ideas. Deep ecology uh, starts with building this perspective that we all are part of this living earth and moves on to say that we need to feel for it. So it's not just activism, it's not just academia, we as individuals, as groups, as communities need to feel for the environment around us. Just as it hurts when we put our finger over a flame, pain for the world alerts us to the injuries of our world and can move us to respond. Here, uh, the deep, uh, deep ecology movement has also been influenced by a person called Leopold, who was earlier a wildlife uh, biologist, but later he completely transformed his understanding. He uh, once saw a wolf being killed in the forest and he said that I saw this wolf dying and I looked into the eyes of this wolf and that expression made me feel that I do not have right or we do not have right as human beings to kill another living being, which could be the wolf, could be the forest. Therefore, these feelings lead to what deep ecologists say is an understanding of spirituality. Spirituality is to do with our inner sense of connection with something larger than ourselves, a larger reality. And the relationship that we share with this larger reality has to be sacred. Finally, deep ecology is not only about ideas and feelings, but it's also about action. They say when we integrate our beliefs, ideas and values into our behavior, we bring them alive 
and give them the power to influence the world. And it's important that we feel for something to be able to take action towards that cause. Uh, the second important uh, understanding in this direction is Gaia or the Gaia principle or Gaia theory. Gaia proposes that our Earth is a living organism and human beings are part of this. And organisms interact with their inorganic surroundings on Earth to form a synergistic self-regulating complex system. So the organic and the inorganic together create this complex system and maintain this synergy that helps to perpetuate the conditions of life on the planet. And the Gaian theorists therefore say it's therefore very, very important to maintain this balance and human beings should not harm the living environment or the living earth. Uh, the third principle in this direction is ecosophy. It's about the philosophy of ecological harmony. It's about the knowledge about nature. It's about the knowledge about the environment and how an equilibrium can be maintained. It's basically an environmental wisdom that contains both norms, rules, values, priorities, and hypotheses concerning the state of affairs in our universe. So the key strands, so this has been uh, some of the important thoughts which has led to the understanding of another key strand called ecofeminism and which looks at the relationship between nature and women and the way this relationship is understood by different ecofeminists differs leading to various uh, thoughts and strands in thinking and in ecofeminism. Some of the important strands we'll discuss now. Nature ecofeminism talks of reaffirming uh, uh, the women nature connection. They say that the problem is not that women have a closer relationship with nature than men. Yeah, that has been a historical reality. But the problem is that this relationship is undervalued. There is a value hierarchy there and there is a dualism that operates there, that something is given more recognition or valued more and women's work with nature is not valued. Nature ecofeminists reject the assumed inferiority of both women and nature as well as the assumed superiority of both men and culture. Some of the key uh, nature ecofeminist would be Mary Daly. She has written this wonderful book called Gene Ecology and uh, I would suggest that if you want to read more and you are interested in this, you should look at this book. The other interesting author is Susan Graffin and uh, she has used a lot of poetry to challenge this dualistic thinking, the othering and instrumental, she has spoken about this instrumental ration, rationality and unbridled technology that's impacting nature and therefore the relationship between women and nature. Uh, the second strand is culture ecofeminism. The cultural uh, constructions of a nurturing nature and nurturing women. For example, uh, we often say that women uh, women's daily work, for example, women's work within the household, women's daily chores, taking care of children, subordinates women. Socially, women's domestic, childbearing and nurturing roles have limited their access to the workplace and public sphere. Thus, for cultural feminist, human nature is embedded in human biology. Now we look into the other strand, which is spiritual ecofeminism. Spiritual ecofeminist draws strength from a variety of earth-based spiritualities and these thinkers tend to move towards what is called goddess worship and they say that uh, human beings uh, historically have always uh, worshipped nature and have this nature was worshipped in the form of goddess and slowly with patriarchal thinking and patriarchal ideology and the market forces coming in, we have moved away from this culture of goddess worship and nature worship. Implicit in the thought of most spiritual ecofeminists is a view, unless patriarchal religion 
can come out of the idea of disembodied male spirit, women should abandon the oppressive confines of religious spaces and run to the open spaces of the nature. The implicit idea again here is about how the patriarchal religion uh, creates several norms and values to uh, negatively impact women's lives and imposes certain conditions and stereotypes for them. So we need to go back to our historical roots, go back to nature and that helps both human beings and nature and therefore women. Some of the spiritual uh, ecofeminist, for example, is uh, Rosemary Radford and uh, she has again written this interesting thing called New Woman, New Earth. Transformative ecofeminism, this is one of the most recent evolution in ecofeminist thought or a recent ecofeminist trend. Uh, the implicit thought here is that women can help transform the meaning of their connection of both nature and culture. Uh, it emphasizes that an ecofeminism grounded in women's traditional feminine virtues, maternal roles, and special relationship to nature need not be reactionary. Such an ecofeminism can be even revolutionary. It can motivate women to get engaged in political action. So one of the key ideas that we derive from transformative ecofeminism is political action. It says that we need to value ourselves, we need to value our work, we need to value our relationship with nature. And if this is not happening, there is destruction of nature, there's oppression, we need to stand against it, we need to resist it, and therefore we need to do political action. The critiques of ecofeminism. Though ecofeminism has evolved trying to understand this intrinsic relationship between women and nature, uh, it has also been critiqued uh, and some of uh, the important uh, thoughts in that direction. For example, Cecilia Jackson has criticized ecofeminism for failing to take into account the difference that exists between women due to class and ethnicity. Another ecofeminist, for example, critiques ecofeminism for retaining the stereotypes of women that are there in a patriarchal society and says, the use of metaphors of women as nurturing, like the earth, and of the earth as female abound are regressive rather than liberating women. So some of the uh, key uh, points of uh, critique here is that uh, we might be uh, uh, again, uh, introducing the stereotypes that are there with women by connecting them uh, too much with their nurturing roles and it needs to be reframed or revisited. You know, what we have discussed brings us to this understanding that uh, irrespective of the differences, all ecofeminists believe human beings are connected to one another and to the non-human world the animal uh, community, plant, etc. Unfortunately, we do not always acknowledge our relationships to and the responsibilities for other people, let alone those we have to the non-human world. As a result, we do violence against each other and to nature, often congratulating ourselves on protecting our self-interest. Uh, and this Therefore, to summarize what we have done so far, we try to look at this intrinsic nature, uh, intrinsic relationship between women and nature, and how some of the larger environmental concerns today, like climate change, environmental degradation, degradation of the forest, is impacting women in different ways and dif impacting different women in different ways. How does ecofeminism attempt to analyze and understand this context? And we have also tried to see how this new understanding of ecofeminism as it has emerged as a third way feminism, how, it is, how has this emerged from which other philosophical understanding 
Therefore, in this context, we have looked at some of the environmental movements and environmental philosophies like deep ecology, Gaia, ecosophy, which has been the herbinger of the ecofeminist idea. And then we went on to look at some of the key strands in the ecofeminist thought, for example, nature ecofeminism, culture ecofeminism, spiritual ecofeminism, transformative ecofeminism. And uh, and we ended with this very important discussion that it is not only important to have ideas and perspectives, feelings, but it is also so important to take action and change this oppressive domination in terms of value hierarchy, value dualism, and the logic of dominance. And, uh, you know, you can take this understanding forward and deepen this understanding through uh, some readings. For example, there is a very interesting reading by Bina Agarwal and she tries to look at this interrelationship between gender and uh, environment and bring in the debates from India through various contextual understanding. Carolyn Marchand uh, talks about radical ecology and the search for a livable world. Um, you know, if you want to go back to some of the classical understanding and how some of the environmental philosophies have influenced uh, the understanding of ecofeminism, uh, you need to look at this classical work by Ernan uh, which talks about the basic principles of deep ecology uh, and ecosophy and ecophilosophy. Uh, some of the, uh, you know, other, for example, Indian authors, Vandana Shiva, um, one classical writing by her, Staying Alive, Women, Ecology and Survival in India. I think uh, this is a basic book, something which you should not miss. I will end with uh, a very interesting quote by Susan Griffin, uh, which should encapsulate uh, the discussions that we had with you so far. And I'll read it out. Uh, we are the birds, eggs, flowers, butterflies, rabbits, cows, sheep. We are women. We rise from the wave. We are women and nature. And he says, he cannot hear us speak, but we hear. Nature has a value that cannot be reduced to its usefulness to culture and women has a value that cannot be reduced to her usefulness to man. And with this, I end this discussion here and hope we move beyond trying to see our usefulness to the non-human world and move towards a more egalitarian society. And all of us should be responsible for that. Thank you so much.